Okay, thanks, Sam, and hello, everybody. Um, so, uh, thanks for making the time to listen. Um, I'm going to present the findings of a report, which is um, two years of collaborative uh, effort, um, which, as Sam pointed out, um, it has involved lots and lots of different research institutions um, from all around the world. And, and my uh, co-authors, uh, Cecile God and everyone else listed have uh, all contributed really equally to the, the production of this report. Um, so I'm going to try and, it's a kind of long report, and I'm going to try and go through it um, as clearly as possible because it was uh, quite, a, quite an undertaking. Um, I'm going to start by just outlining why we did this research. Um, and as many of you will know who, who are listening in, there just seems to be a kind of cacophony of different voices at the moment on the whole um, livestock issue. And it seems to be um, exemplified by these two slides where on the one hand, um, there's a whole host of reports and publications and media commentary on the fact that you know, raising cattle, beef are the source of all evil, they're trashing the planet, they're causing loads and loads of climate change, and that we should be stopping eating beef. And on the other hand, you get a whole counter argument that says, no, 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 this is all wrong. In fact, if you graze animals right, grass fed beef can actually solve the problem of climate change through their grazing actions and their role in soil carbon sequestration. So we thought, we, you know, we were confused. We thought we really wanted to try and get to the bottom of this argument and, and figure out what, what the answer actually was. So we asked ourselves a set of questions, which all boils down to the what is the role of grazing ruminants in the net greenhouse gas balance. But bundled up in that big question are things like how does sequestration work? If you graze them right, can they sequester carbon? Do they sequester more than they emit? What about methane? Is methane actually the problem it's been made out to be? What about animal dung? So many claims being made about their essential role in nutrient recycling. How, how does that play into the equation about the role of livestock? And what about new and emerging drivers of land use change? Isn't the problem all now with soy and the Cerrado uh, and, and, and the problems there? And ultimately, can we eat our way out of the climate problem by eating more grass-fed beef? So those are the questions we did ask ourselves. There are some really, really important questions that we didn't ask or address in this report. The nutritional qualities of grass-fed, there's a whole debate going on there. The role of grazing systems in fostering and also undermining uh, biodiversity. The role of grass, the grazing systems and water use. The whole animal welfare issue. The role of different systems in uh, fostering uh, zoonotic disease and antibiotics resistance and so forth. And then all the difficult issues of jobs, livelihoods, traditions and so forth. And I think another really, really important thing uh, to emphasise is that we look at the, the role of grazing systems in climate change, but we didn't do it as a comparison exercise. We didn't say, is it better or worse to eat grass fed than it is to eat uh, intensively reared grain fed beef or to eat pigs and poultry? We really set ourselves the, the, the so-called simple task of just looking at the claims and counterclaims about the sequestration issue. So that's that. This was, as Sam has already pointed out, the, these are all the co-authors and the collaborating institutions that you can read yourself when the, um, when the report's out tomorrow. Um, so this was the bones of the dispute that we addressed. First is the balance of greenhouse gas emissions and removals. And I'm going to go in over these three key um, tranches of question in, in turn. So first is the argument that ruminants generate loads of greenhouse gas emissions, particularly methane and nitrous oxide, as well as the counter argument that if you manage them well, if you, um, they will sequester carbon. The second set of arguments is over the role of methane, the fact that it has a very short lifespan. So is it really a problem or is it actually the problem of um, CO2 from more intensive uh, managed systems that is the real problem here. 
um, as well as the role of uh, nitrogen and nitrous oxide in causing like um, in causing uh, the global warming problem, as opposed to the role of livestock in in providing a source of nitrogen. So we considered those two arguments. And then we looked at historical and emerging drivers of land use change. So historically, livestock have used have driven land use change that, you know, destruction of the Amazon is well known. Um, plus the counter argument that now the situation is changing with our demand for pigs and poultry, which are causing demand for soy, which is causing um, the clearance of of a region such as the Cerrado. So those are the three issues that we addressed in turn, and I'm gonna go through them. But first of all, the first thing we had to encounter when doing this work was to think, well, actually, what is a grass-fed animal? And what indeed are grasslands? Um, and those two kind of simple, it's not as simple as you might think. For a start, um, there are no, um, the definition of a, of a grazing system is our livestock, according to the FAO, a livestock that are reared for most of their life and most of the time on grass. But bundled up in that broad definition is the fact that um, a, an animal may be fed different things at different stages in their lifespan. So they may be reared largely on grass and then sent to a feedlot to be fattened up in the last few weeks of their life on, on grains. Um, they may be reared entirely on grass, but that grass may effectively function as a monoculture. It may be uh, just a combination of a couple of species and may receive lots of fertilizers, occasionally irrigation. So in that sense, its so-called naturalness is, is up for question. Uh, another thing is, actually, we don't really know how much grassland we actually have. A best estimate is about 26% uh, of the Earth's um, uh, usable surface, but there is a huge range in that definition. And where a sort of... Um, grassy grassy forest ends and a tree gra grassland ends uh, begins is 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 a, is a moot point um grasslands many grasslands have been around for a very very long time some grasslands were recently formed from forests so what the the baseline is is another big question and there's always a counterfactual use for that grassland. It could sometimes be used for arable. It could be used for nature conservation. It could be used for bioenergy. Um, there's also the fact that there's an overlap between grass-fed systems and mixed crop livestock systems. So mixed systems in which the animals eat a lot of grass, but they also eat byproducts, agricultural residues, and sometimes grains as well. So there's a blurring of the boundaries there. And there are in fact no official certif gov government stamped certifications of grass fed and the informal certifications that are out there vary in their stringency. You know, some specify that the animals, you know, that the grass shouldn't be fertilized and the animals should be 100% year round. Others have more uh, relaxed definitions. So there's a lot of uncertainty there. So if you try and use your best estimates possible and you look at the amount of animal protein that we get from grazing only ruminants we find as this slide shows that the overall contribution to human protein availability is really really low it's about one gram of protein per person per day. Um, the global average is about 81 grams. And, and as you can see from that slide, um, more than half of the uh, protein that we consume on a global average basis comes from plants, um, crops, and, and uh, ruminants supply a little bit more than grazing systems because you get ruminants in mixed and crop systems and so forth. That's not to deny the fact that in many parts of the world, it, parts of sub-Saharan Africa and so forth, that, that protein availability from grazing only systems can be a real lifeline, can be highly important. And it's really, you know, we do stress the fact that you have to take a sort of context specificity into account. We, we try to look at this in aggregate. Um, so, but the main point to note is that grazing systems per se don't provide us with a great deal to eat at an aggregate level. So onto the, onto the dispute. So uh, first, the balance of greenhouse gas emissions and removals. Do grass-fed animals sequester more than they actually emit? Well, the first thing to ask is how much do they actually emit? So uh, that well-known uh, FAO figure of 
roughly 15% of global greenhouse gas emissions comes from livestock. Um, most of those, about 80% of those, comes from ruminants, sheep, goats, cattle. And, and cattle, since they're the, mo the dominant ruminant species, account for uh, most of that, about 60% of the livestock total. Grass-fed only cattle, grazing system only cattle, bearing in mind those hedges and caveats about how you define a grass-fed animal, uh, account for about 2.7%. So uh, just over a quarter, between a quarter and a third of all cattle-related emissions. And it's worth comparing their reasonably significant emissions as compared with the protein that they provide to humans. So, and that's what a lot of life cycle studies show. They find that beef in extensive systems, these are just a couple of sample um, studies, show that beef in uh, more extensive systems tend to have higher emissions than beef in intensive systems, higher emissions than other animal products, and higher emissions than, than plant products. Although, as you can see from the, the right-hand figure, there's a lot of range within that. And we want to put that out there, not because we're making comparisons, but just to show what very traditional life cycle assessments tend to show, because those animals in extensive systems tend to be uh, less productive and tend to be consuming uh, feeds that tend to be less digestible and therefore lead to greater um, emissions of methane. So, First of all, if we're going to look at the set their sequestration potential, we need to know how animals actually help reduce how the sequestration process works. And it's important to emphasize that, you know, there are other ways of sequestering carbon. They don't all involve an animal. So forestry is an obvious example, rewilding, um, conservation agriculture in um, arable systems. There are different ways in which you can um, build organic matter in soils and in turn uh, cause uh, carbon to be sequestered. And they all come with a different balance of costs and benefits that I don't have time to go into here. Um, when it comes to animals, ruminants, um, the way it works is as follows. So obviously the plants, they grow and in so growing, they take carbon out of the um, atmosphere. Um, and then the plants die, and if that plant matter, their root biomass and their, their above ground uh, leaves and uh, stalks and so forth is buried, that contains carbon. And if that buried carbon is left undisturbed, there's lots of ifs here, and if climate, soil and other conditions are right, then the carbon may convert into a more stable form, which means that the carbon that was in the atmosphere has been converted by the plants into a carbon form that is now below ground and that stays there. So that's the theory. And how the animals are supposed to help with this is that they nibble away and they chomp away and that stimulates the plants to grow and that can cause the plants to put down deep roots and then also obviously the and the roots contain uh, carbon and then the animals they eat um, they eat the plants and then they excrete some of that and the manure uh, contains both carbon and nitrogen so the carbon gets onto the ground um, where it may be buried and the nitrogen that remember was already in the plants so it's not new nitrogen the animals haven't magically created nitrogen but the the, the nitrogen that's already in the plants now gets redeposited into the soil which um, can help with the recycling of that nitrogen which can help with the with the fostering of the new generation of plants that grows. So that's the way it works. And if that carbon that is in the manure is buried in the soil and left undisturbed, then you can um, get some kind of sequestration happening. But there are lots of buts, and I'm not going to go into this slide in detail, but it's, you know, here are some of them. Um, the climate, 
and the rainfall conditions need to be right, right so you can have sequestration in the rainy season and then a drought comes along and all that sequestration is reversed. Um, you get a fire, that's another problem. Um, the soil type and texture needs to be right, very thin soils can't sequester very much. Um, there needs to be sufficient nitrogen in the soil and phosphorus for plants to grow. What the species mix is, that's another factor. What the baseline climate vegetation was like. So, you know, you may find off that you're, you're better off getting sequestration by letting that land rewild and reverting to forest, as well as the number of animals per hectare per year. If you overgraze, you're going to need to let get get a, an actual loss of carbon from soils yeah, you know do the animals receive any supplementary feed which adds nitrogen from external sources to the to the soil which is kind of cheating if you like so um there are all these different variables and they all have an effect on the ultimate sequestration outcome so that's the first thing the second thing is that you know soil stops sequestering carbon after a while so um you, you could say it's a bit like a sponge that 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 the soils take up carbon from the atmosphere and after a while they don't take up anymore until there's some radical new change in management so those gains diminish over time until there are no the, the removals of carbon the the, the the flows out of carbon from the soils equals the flows in and that's what that slide shows so that's that's the kind of how it works and there have been a lot of different estimates made of the sequestration potential that grazing systems can have and they're going to be different depending on the region and on the management regime but the region the regional the, the agroecology the ag agroecological variables as i've just pointed out are quite specific and they very much influence the outcome but what this slide shows is that the the black lines are all the peer-reviewed um, estimates of the sequestration potential and they do range but the range that their overall figures are much much lower and the range is lower than than the the um, figures on the right the, the estimates on the right which are in gray which are those that are not peer-reviewed and made by people like um, Alan Savory's holistic um, grazing institute so you can see that the claims from the non peer-reviewed studies are wildly higher than those that are, have been academically peer-reviewed. So the other thing that I, it, you know, needs to be pointed out is that there is going to be a trade-off between the number of animals, that's the stocking rate on the land, which is going to cause methane and nitrous oxide emissions, and the sequestration rate. So in a way, it depends what numbers you plug into your estimates. And what this slide is really trying to show is that um, the, the dotted and the undotted lines um, give uh, different estimates of the um, of the stocking rate and of assumptions about what your sequestration rate is. So if you assume, and I'm taking the solid dark blue line there, if you assume that there are not many animals per hectare, and if you make an assumption that there's a high sequestration rate, you can get a net um, carbon removal from the atmosphere. So there's a credit there, okay? The animals are net removers of carbon from the atmosphere. But that depends on your assuming a very low stocking rate and a very high sequestration rate. If you assume a higher number of animals per hectare, which is actually not that high for, say, a country like the UK, and you assume a lower sequestration rate, you can see that the methane emissions um, are going to outweigh any sequestration gain. So in most cases, you're going to get um, emissions higher than removals. And I should say these are modelled relationships. So we plugged in theoretical, uh, theoretically high and low sequestration rates and, and different stocking rates. So they don't reflect real life situations, but that's the point of illustration that that you have that what what your numbers are. Uh, in, in the absence of empirical evidence depends on the assumptions you're making about the rate of sequestration. So 
that goes back to the kind of what does that, that Alan Savory and those sort of very optimistic claims, what do they actually do? First of all, they take a very high end estimate of the overgrazing land area. As I said, we don't know exactly how much grazing land there are. There is, but if you if you assume a, a large, a, a higher end of the estimates, and then you plug in a very optimistic estimate of annual sequestration rates and you roll this out globally regardless of the huge variations in soil type climate type vegetation type, and so on and so forth and then you don't you know you forget to to factor in the fact that the rate of sequestration dwindles over time so you assume those high rates can be continued and then you don't factor in the animal's own emissions then you get a figure that says, well, you know, livestock can help climate change. But each of those steps is so flawed in themselves that it, it means that the, 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 the number you get at the end of it is, is flawed, you know, on in, at many, many levels. So this is really just to illustrate. This is um, this figure. Um, you can see that the the brown estimates, um, the one by uh, Pete Smith et al, um, it shows the, uh, 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 an optimistic but academically regular, rigorous estimate of the sequestration potential from grazing animals. Okay, and you can see it's just a little bit below the line. The, the long, long dot and dash are the non-peer-reviewed um, Alan Savory estimates. The green um, column shows grazing livestock emissions and then the purple column shows the net of that so grazing livestock emissions minus removals and you can see it's hard to see but the grazing animals are still um, net emitters of greenhouse gas emissions then you look at overall livestock emissions that's the one that says uh, Jebe et al uh, 2013 and you can see um, that that adds further emissions to the problem and then the purple column um, removes is net of sequestration, and you can see that they're still quite significant. The livestock sector as a whole is a significant contributor to the problem of climate change. In other words, um, sequestration really doesn't do very much to address the problem of uh, livestock related emissions. And then the final two columns, um, the penultimate one is. Um, annual emissions from all sources and you can see that livestock are 15 percent of those and then the final column is where we need to be in 2050 if we're going to have a hope of meeting our uh, two degrees climate uh, paris climate target so you can see if you compare that figure um, that that column with the um, the one on the left hand side which is the sequestration potential from grazing systems um, you're going to see that its contribution is minuscule and and it's really important to to, to just emphasize the fact that the the removals are outweighed by their emissions so grazing animals are net contributors to the problem of climate change so the second question was the methane and the nitrous oxide question. So does methane actually matter? It's got this short shelf life. We all know that it, it, you know, it breaks down into CO2 over about 12 years, and that CO2 is biogenic, part of the short-term carbon cycle. So are these um, ruminant uh, methane emissions really a problem? And the answer is yes, they are. Um, so just to put it very simply, um, uh, if you take a, a pulse of carbon dioxide, if it's emitted into the atmosphere, it is uh, de facto permanently emitted. Any subsequent pulse of carbon dioxide emitted will add to that first pulse. So the effect is cumulative, as the top figure shows. It's a bit psychedelic, but um, it shows that carbon dioxide related emissions will rise and rise and rise. Now with methane, the situation is a bit different. Any pulse of methane um, has a more temporary effect and then it breaks down into the atmosphere to um, nearly zero, not quite zero, over time. Any subsequent pulse of methane replaces rather than adds to what has 
um, gone before. So that's why people argue that methane is not a problem because it breaks down. But as you can see with this figure, um, the, the, problem, the problem of methane only goes away if the source of the methane goes away. So, for example, you've got a cow and it's emitting methane and you slaughter it and the methane will break down in the atmosphere and disappear within 12 years. And that's great. But the problem with arguing for livestock in grazing systems is that you're going to replace that animal. You're going to keep your grazing system going. Um, and therefore, the methane will continue to be emitted. So, so long as the source of the methane continues, so methane continues to be a problem. And it's also important to emphasize the different scales on those two figures. So uh, carbon dioxide, the global warming potential of carbon dioxide is much lower than the problem, uh, than the global warming potential of methane. And while, you know, it's not an, it's firstly, it's not an either or issue. Um, we need to be addressing carbon dioxide and we need to be addressing methane. And if we are going to uh, try and um, avoid the risk of overshooting, that two degree target, then it's quite important to get those methane emissions down uh, quite rapidly, while not forgetting that we also need to be addressing carbon dioxide. On the nitrogen issue, um, so again, it's important to point out that sequestration potential is limited by nitrogen availability because the grass needs nitrogen to go to grow. And the sources can be a synthetic fertilizer, legumes or manure. They all, once that nitrogen gets into the soil, uh, are likely one way or another to lead to nitrous oxide emissions, which is very potent at 300 times more potent than carbon dioxide. Um, manure doesn't add new nitrogen to the system. It redistributes what's already in the grass. It's really important to emphasize that point. So if the animals are grazed on another field and brought in into uh, you know, a different field, then they may be adding nitrogen to the system, but really they're borrowing the nitrogen from a different, from that other field. Um, in, and, and that will work if we have lots and lots of land. So for example, an animal can graze on an upland, be brought down at night, um, their manure can then be used to fertilize croplands. And that works when there's lots and lots of land available. But Lots of land available is exactly what we don't have anymore. So, so that, those traditional systems are problematic in the context of a population of seven, eight, nine, ten billion 10 billion people. So really, the point here is that there are going to be trade-offs between carbon sequestration and nitrous oxide. We need nitrogen to make the sequestration work, but most sources of nitrogen, all sources of nitrogen also lead to nitrous oxide emissions. That's true of manure, and in a land-limited world, there isn't enough manure to meet our fertilizer needs. So then there's the final, and I think the hardest question, which is land use change. So isn't soy now the problem? Well, I think historically, we're all aware that uh, ruminants have had quite a big role to play in driving land use change. Uh, many grasslands were once forest, and we you know we've all heard about amazonian deforestation and the fact that uh, ruminants have directly had a hand in deforestation because forests have been cleared to pasture and then indirectly and this this is uh, all animals are implicated in this both um forest and this and grasslands have been cleared to produce feed grains and soy so and that leads to the release of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere and and as this figure shows um you know, the green is, uh, is attributable, is deforestation attributable to cattle pasture clearance. And you can see that in most parts of South America, they've, they've been heavily implicated in the problem. But there are new threats now. So demand for uh, cereals and oil seeds to feed intensive pigs, poultry, and uh, ruminants, so both beef and dairy, have um, a leading to clearance of gra grazing lands, historically grazing lands, and the Cerrado. And, and that ploughing up of the grasslands leads to the release of the carbon that's captured in the soils. But that just because we have new problems, that doesn't mean that grazing ruminants aren't a problem. On the contrary, they remain a problem, partly because land continues to be cleared and forests continue to be cut down 
for pasture, um, not just feed crops. And secondly, because those grazing lands to support higher livestock numbers tend to be intensified through the use of synthetic fertilizers, monoculture crops, which um, cause, meth cause uh, nitrous oxide emissions because of the intensification, and of course, undermine uh, the biodiversity of those natural grasslands, which uh, biodiversity being an important issue that we didn't go into, but it's worth noting. Um, so what about the future? Well, the future is inherently uncertain, but um, there'll be lots of factors that influence our demand for arable land in the future. So the more meat we want, the more arable land we're going to um, demand as well for, um, for feed crops for the animals. The more we intensify our production systems, so too will the pressure on arable land increase. Um, if we uh, have lower levels of feed crop yield improvements, then we're going to need more land for a given quantity of crop. Uh, less productive animals with lower feed conversion efficiencies, ditto. Uh, if we are not effective in uh, limiting and in in controlling land use change through legislation, that will place more pressure on land, plus demand for biofuels, bioenergy, carbon capture and storage, and so forth. And lower demand, well, it's the counter to all that. So those are the factors influencing arable land demand. Then there's going to be factors influencing grassland. So obviously higher demand for ruminant animals, less productive animals, more demand for pasture-based systems, um, and higher competing pressures on that grassland, for example, for bioenergy production and, and the reverse for lower demand. So, you know, the future is going to depend on all those different variables. And I found this quite a, quite a striking paper that came out recently, which, which looks at all the different projections of future land use based on different scenarios, different assumptions about yield productivities, all sorts of different assumptions. And you can see cropland demand will go wildly up or it will go wildly down. Ditto for pasture and perhaps less, less divergently for forests. But, you know, the future is pretty uncertain and it is what we make of it. So that's where the next slide comes along. So what, what could we make of it? What, we have a what if scenario that we, we explored in the report. So the idea of livestock on leftovers that makes sort of intuitive sense. What if we confine production, livestock production to land unsuited to cropping, so only on grasslands, plus we fed animals byproducts, so agricultural crop residues, plus some food waste. And we limited our consumption to the amount of livestock that could be supported by those, those feed sources. How much would we get to eat? So again, there are gonna be lots of assumptions that go into making these estimates. But um, some of my colleagues that are in on this, um, on this uh, webinar were, were produce these figures. And, and you can see that if you just look at ruminant products from pastures and byproducts, then you get about 13 grams of animal protein per person per day. If you take, if you include all animals, so that's pigs and poultry, um, then you get slightly, slightly more. And, and I've put a little asterisk there because um, the higher end of that estimates of that range, the vertical line, assumes that you're feeding pigs some grains just to kind of optimize their, their nutrition. So that's sort of um, not entirely a, a leftover scenario. You can see that the global average animal protein consumption as it stands today is higher than that figure. And then the projected global average is higher still. And just on the far right, you can see the average high income, what, what we on average in parts in, in places like the UK, Europe, the US consume, which is very, very much higher than what would be supported by a livestock on leftover scenario. And it's also worth pointing out that livestock are not leftovers because, um, oh, sorry, grasslands are not leftovers because you can do other things with that land. Um, you, there are also alternative possible uses that come with their balance of costs and benefits, environmental and social and all the rest of it. And that if you're going to optimize grazing systems to enhance productivity, you may not necessarily be optimizing them for sequestration. So there can be a trade off there. Um, that also needs to be thought about. So um, 
how, how am I doing for time? Um, if you could wrap up in the next five minutes. Okay. So um, in terms of the implications for uh, land use, this, this was a piece of work that was led by uh, my colleague Ellen Roos on the call and on the, on the webinar. And it just factored in, uh, looked at a whole range of different uh, livestock uh, scenarios from kind of business as usual to only eating uh, intensively produced meat, for only eating uh, dairy products and poultry, uh, a vegan scenario, a speculative artificial meat scenario, and what we might call an ecological, a livestock on leftovers scenario. Um, and it looked at, so, so the far right one looks at uh, uh, the, the implications for land use of um, just consuming, confining your consumption to uh, what could be obtained from uh, grasslands and byproducts. And it found that if you, if you did that and carried on with sort of current less healthy consumption patterns, um, it would exceed currently used arable land. So you, wouldn't, you, would, you would have to clear some more land to meet that scenario. Um, if, 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 if we all complied with more healthy eating guidelines, you could uh, reduce your land requirement on the ecological leftover scenario, but it would still be slightly higher than some of the other plant-based and artificial meat scenarios. And then also, um, this is the next slide, which shows the greenhouse gas implications of those. Um, the uh, ecological leftover scenario only under a sort of healthy eating scenario uh, where consumption is really quite drastically uh, reduced would we uh, meet come within uh, you know near of meeting our emissions reduction scenarios the uh, the green uh, columns not the sort of uh, the negative emissions show very very theoretically uh, the sequestration potential arising from those different scenarios and again the the less you use land um, by you use less land by consuming fewer animal products which in theory frees up more land for uh, sequestration via um, forestry, biomass and so on and so forth. We want to stress that that may or may not be a good thing to do and there will also be trade-offs for things like food security, uh, uh, biodiversity, jobs and so on and so forth. But it was a theoretical um, exercise that shows that we have choices about how to feed ourselves and how to use land and they will come with um, different implications for land use and for greenhouse gas emissions. So just to kind of round up now, to summarize, um, we have this limited land. That's the biggest problem that we have. We have limited land. If we uh, convert further land uh, for food production or for other purposes, the consequences for climate as well as for other things that we didn't look at, such as biodiversity, will be catastrophic. We have lots of problems. We need urgently to halt land conversion, stop destroying species, and at the same time, we need to feed ourselves effectively which means meeting our, meeting our needs, perhaps not necessarily fulfilling our demands. So the question is, what's the least bad way of using land, bearing in mind that all uses will have some kind of negative consequence? Um, we didn't answer that question because that is an enormous societal question um, which has to bring in lots of environmental and non-environmental considerations. We just looked at climate change and we didn't compare different systems of livestock production. We just tried to look at the role of grazing systems in its contribution to causing or mitigating climate change. And what we concluded was that current trends in meat and dairy demand are not sustainable. If we maintained our current trajectories of demand for meat, but supplied it all through grass-fed systems, the consequences for land use change would be catastrophic. But we're not saying that intensive production is therefore preferable. We very much stress that intensive systems, whether monogastric, pigs and poultry, or ruminants generate their own problems and don't constitute a solution. Um, the livestock on leftovers, feeding uh, byproducts and using land unsuited to crop production might be an option, but even there, there will be trade-offs, choices to be made, and greenhouse gas emissions from the methane that the animals produce will still be high. 
It seems to us all that an inescapable consequence of our research is that high consumers need to of meat and dairy products need to be cutting back their consumption and that that holds whatever the animal type whether it's pigs poultry or or beef or, or dairy and whatever the system in which it's been produced whether intensively or grass-fed we can't escape the fact that if we're going to have a hope in hell of addressing our climate products problems we're going to be needing to cut back on animal product consumption. So I'm going to finish there. Um, the report's um, coming out tomorrow um, and um, we'll have some questions and uh, discussion amongst the panellists now. Thank you very much.